I'm Michelle Kelly, editor of Cottage Life Magazine. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Cottage Life Podcast. In this episode, we chat with Jody Allaire from Birds Canada about how to recognize common cottage country birds. Plus, we'll hear an essay about a favorite and slightly obsessive cottage pastime. And we solve a very annoying middle-of-the-night problem with a handy fix. This is the Cottage Life Podcast, where every day is the weekend. Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. If you know me, you know I spend a lot of time outdoors. Whether I'm camping with my family or fishing in my top-secret spot, there's nowhere I'd rather be than in the wild. But we all have to head home at some point, and I'm pretty sure that the mosquitoes have put a homing device on me because sometimes they can be just as annoying in my backyard. So when I'm back in the city, I use the backyard mosquito lamp from off. Whether I'm barbecuing my breakfast or having a backyard dinner with my family, I know I'll be safe from mosquitoes for up to six hours, which means I may never have to go inside again. Is it me, or are there more people birding since the pandemic began? I'm not wrong. Birding is having a moment, according to Jody Allaire. He is the Director of Citizen Science and Community Engagement at Birds Canada, so he would know. Jody says that Canadians have been participating in birding this past year more than ever before. He's seen record engagement at Bird Canada digital events, everything from webinars to live streams and podcasts. And it's not hard to understand why we're so suddenly bird crazy. Bird watching allows us to slow down and escape into nature, something that we have needed so much during these difficult days of the pandemic. Jody is here to tell us how to find some of the most common bird species in cottage country, and not just with our eyes, but with our ears as well. So we've all gone to the birds. Why do you think that is, Jody? Well, it's hard. It's hard not to fall in love with birds, right? They uh, they're just absolutely amazing animals. And I think during the pandemic, a lot of people were forced to spend a ton of time at home um, in their backyards if they have them, and in their local green spaces. And that much exposure to those natural areas, you know, people people realize that there were birds in in these places everywhere, and and birds have this amazing ability you know to sort of transform and connect uh people to the to the natural world and of course those amazing bird songs they have which are which are just really wildly captivating yes for sure and you know what is the most amazing thing i have found in in my birding journey which really did take off at the beginning of the pandemic when i started taking daily walks through the park for you know millions and millions of walks it felt like because it was one of the only things that i could do with my family is once we started noticing the birds, it was like a whole new world because you once you start to notice them and once you learn about them, it's just this whole new part of your outdoor experience. Uh, so when we chatted at the March, uh, the show, at the Cottage Life show in March, we went over some of the interesting sounds that birds made. And I, I loved that. I learned so much. And so I thought we could bring some of that discussion to the podcast today too, and maybe go over these five birds um, that are common across cottage country um, and across Canada, in fact. Um, and we could just listen to their sounds. And then you can tell us a little bit about the birds and teach us some fun mnemonics so that we can remember the sounds. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Let's do it. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's start with this bird. Jody, so what was that? Yeah, that is the the wonderful spring song of the black cap chickadee. And ah. and, what, and what you're hearing there is is sort of the classic Phoebe, Phoebe. They're adorable and feisty and tough and can handle you know, minus 30 temperatures and store food through the winter. Like they're just an incredible hardy, you know, Canadian bird, right? Yeah. Uh, I always feel like they're like dressed up to go out for a night on the town, you know, with that, <laughs> that really dark dapper cap on their head and, and their black bib, you know, they're, they're a sharp looking bird. They have a very short rounded 
I like to refer to as the Swiss army knife of bills. It could do anything, everything. Um, it's incredible. And, uh, and they have sort of a grayish blue uh, back with some white wing bars, pale underneath, a nice long tail with some beautiful little white edging to their edder tail feathers. They're just a, a sharp, incredible looking bird. Yeah, I find that the thing that I notice about them first is their black head, mm. hence the name black caps. Love the look of this bird. It's adorable and certainly one of the most familiar birds and gorgeous. I love that you call them a hardy little Canadian bird. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, so next up is a bird that I think um, most Canadians would recognize right off the bat by the looks of it, especially here's a little hint, sports fan. So let's play that one. Okay, so that is definitely seems more aggressive than the chickadee call. Uh, what what bird is that, Jody? Yeah, that is that is a, another just absolutely wonderful bird called the blue jay. Yeah, and uh, well, the blue jay is a fairly recognizable bird to many people, but if you've never had a close look at a blue jay, they are even more stunning than the baseball team logo implies. They are they've got this incredible blue back with like almost iridescent shiny blue flight feathers on their on their wings and they've got this one of my favorite features is this this erect blue crest on their head and sometimes it's raised sometimes it's not and underneath the crest on their on their head they have this black outline it's almost like crest eyeliner <laughs> if that makes any sense <laughs> with this really cool black pattern in their crest and what we heard is the, is the classic call and the mnemonic to remember is that they say their name J, 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 J. That's that's the most most commonly heard vocalization from a blue jay. They do sing, but it's something that we don't really hear that often. Yeah, it's funny. And they, I find that there is quite a few around. Um, like, like I said, I think it's one of the birds that everyone really recognizes. But something that I think people don't know as well is that they can be sort of aggressive, these birds. Like, I think I said to you before that they're kind of jerks, <laughs> which I'm not sure you like that characterization because, of course, they're just doing their thing. Well, the, the neat thing about blue jays is that in, in the entire uh, Corvidae family, crows, ravens, jays, uh, is that they're very smart. And what blue jays do is they put those smarts to good use, right? And so, I, yeah, so I consider it less of being like jerks and more of being uh, very intelligent and, you know, taking advantage of situations, whether that's, you know, maybe... Uh, taking some eggs from nests or, um, you know, being aggressive to, to other birds. No, I guess they're just doing their thing. It's the, it's the truth. Okay. So um, sort of an opposite bird we're going to go to next in, in, in some senses, I think. Um, and I can explain why I think that in a minute, but let's hear the next sound. Yeah, that is the red-breasted nuthatch. Um, they they're really teeny. You know, they're they're uh, even slightly smaller than a black-capped chickadee uh, without, and they don't really have a long tail. They're very compact because they creep around uh, trees a lot. Um, they have kind of reddish rust color underneath, more pronounced than the males and the females. And they've got this kind of steel blue back, and they've got a black cap with a with a white and black eye stripe so they're really slick looking birds and also a very large bill for, for cracking open nuts and seeds the the thing that's that i love about them is uh and i think a lot of people really notice is that they tend to go upside down all the time they, they crawl around upside down on trees to, and and as soon as you start watching them they, they start doing it right away which is pretty awesome so uh, tell us about the mnemonic for this bird. Yeah. So um, to me, they sound like a really tiny, like car horn, you know, like a, <laughs> like a, like a miniaturized, like clown car, car horn, you know? And, uh, and I think Michelle, I think the quote I gave about how small they are is that you could, I think you could stuff like 50 of them in your glove compartment. Yes, in your, that is in your what car. you said. That's yeah. right. I pictured it. They're really small. Yeah. Right? They're, they're super teeny. 50 yeah. of them in the clown uh, car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Next bird. Now, this next bird is a real stunner, and I'm sure that it has delighted you uh, if you've seen it. It's for sure the one of the first birds that got me into birding, actually, and was such a thrill to see it for the first time in our park. So let's hear the sound. Oh. 
Okay, so the mnemonic that you taught me for this bird is so perfect because now it's all I hear when I hear the sound. Let's let's tell everyone what bird that is. That is the American goldfinch. And the uh, the mnemonic to remember its flight call, which is what we just heard, is potato chip. <laughs> and which I love. It's so cottagey, of course. Potato it's perfect. It's perfect. They say <laughs> potato chip. And and when they fly, right. they sort of undulate. So they sort of like go up and then they go down and they go up and they go down. They don't fly anywhere in a straight line, right? They they're, they're right. it's like they're always flying on a little mini roller coaster. So they're bright, bright yellow with black wings and a black cap and a very almost perfectly triangular pink bill. And, uh, and they've got black and white on their tail. So there's this gorgeous combination of black and yellow. Um, yeah, I love it. I love, I love this bird. I think it's gorgeous and I love that mnemonic. Okay. So next up, this is a bird that we get a ton of questions about all the time. Um, so I think we'll hear the call and then it's actually not the call that we're going to play. This one's a little bit of a curveball here, um, but we'll hear the sound and then we'll talk a little bit about what the sound is and why this bird is doing this particular sound. So let's hear the sound. Okay, I think a lot of cottagers will know that sound and it will make them upset. <laughs> what is that sound, Jody? Well, what you're hearing is sort of classic woodpecker drumming. And in this yes. particular case, you're hearing the territorial drumming of the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Yes, and we get letters all the time from people who ask us, what is this sound and how can I make it go away? Because it often happens early in the morning and it will wake them up. Um, and the thing is, is that once we tell them what the sound is, they tend to um, tolerate it a little bit more because they know that it's made by this really cool looking bird. So tell us a little bit about what this bird look like, it looks like, and then we'll get into what they're actually doing by drumming. Yeah, sure. So uh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker is, is a very complex and beautiful looking woodpecker. Uh, it's a really neat pattern of, of black, uh, very black wings with some white bars. They have uh, a red throat and a red cap on the males. Uh, the females have a, have a paler throat. And they're, they're a good size. They're, they're about the size of, uh, uh, of a robin, like a skinny robin or, or a hairy woodpecker, if you're familiar with that. So quick, quick question about this, um, about the look before we move on to the sound. It's funny that it's called yellow bellied. It does have sort of that yellow coloration on its chest, but really I find in looking at this bird, particularly from afar, what you notice most is the red um, head and the red throat more than the yellow belly, if you will. Is, is that just me? Um, yeah, they definitely have a yellow belly and a yellow belly. Um, and it's not, it's very subtle. It is very subtle is because subtle. woodpeckers subtle. often so, have their bellies up against the tree, right? So yes. tell us a little bit about what that sound is. Like, so is that, I'm guessing that has to do with mating. Yeah. Um, Always does. Indeed. It's, it's most, yeah, most sounds are, are sort of connected there anyway with, with pair bonding or, or courtship or, or, or display. Um, in this particular case, you know, woodpeckers, a lot of woodpeckers, they peck to drill holes and they peck to get food, but they also do pattern drumming to proclaim territory. So woodpeckers are not songbirds. And so they don't, they don't sing to proclaim territory or to attract mates. They'll do drumming uh, in replacement of a song, which I think is amazing, right? That's a really cool thing to do. And why wouldn't you, right? You're built to be pecking wood. Yeah. And this is the mnemonic. Ready? And I learned this yep. from my birding mentor many, many years ago, and it has stuck ever since. And the mnemonic goes, my head really hurts. I think I'll stop. <laughs> So it goes, it starts, Who it's can really, blame him? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it starts out really, really fast. And then it slows down like, whew, that was exhausting. Um, yeah. And so great. let me ask you this, like you seem to hear a lot about it, you know, getting banged against a aluminum siding. So do they prefer that because it makes more noise than say, you know, a, a rotted log or something that's going to make a bit more dull? Like they're trying to be loud here. Yeah. Yeah. If, if your goal is to attract mates and, and tell other males that this is your territory, then you want to proclaim that as big and as loud as possible. 
right? right? But yeah, sometimes they will use a part of a cottage to do this. They're not trying to damage the cottage and they're not going to damage the cottage with this. They're just trying to get as loud as possible. Um, but it, this only happens for a few weeks, right? They're not going to do this. They're not going to do this all summer. The best advice to give really people who are annoyed by the sound is just to say, just, you know, wait it out. It will go away and try to appreciate it while it's there. Cause it is really cool to hear. And, and, you know, that's why you go to the cottage is to hear these kinds of sounds, which brings me to the next part um, that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, cottagers, now that they know how to identify these birds, I wanted to give them a few tips on how they can make their property more friendly to birds. So I know that one thing um, that we've always talked about and, and we, we don't have to get too far into is, um, you know, don't have your cat around outside. That's a good one. Cats can, are really dangerous for birds. And also uh, try to avoid having glass railings because birds obviously can hit them and, you know, they can be fatal collisions. Um, but the thing that I think a lot of cottagers don't realize is the connection uh, between birds and their gardens. I think people think of their gardens as attracting particular insects, but in fact, uh, your gardens, the trees, the bushes, the flowers, everything that you put in your garden um, can really make a difference for making your, bar your yard bird friendly. So can you give us a few tips on what you would choose um, to keep the birds um, you know, interested in coming to your yard? Think native species, plant native, um, and reduce or avoid using any chemical pesticides or herbicides ever uh, for a variety of reasons, not just for the birds and insects, but also for the water quality um, right. on, on your property. It's just not worth it. And in fact, you won't need to use any of that stuff if you are choosing to naturalize your property with native trees and shrubs and reducing or eliminating uh, your yard space. You know, like who who likes to mow grass? I certainly loathe cutting grass. Yeah, um, for sure. And uh, and and what's the point? You know, it's uh, you know it doesn't mean you can't have a, certainly a, a, a patch of of mowed grass, especially if you have kids or pets or, or whatever, if you want that space, that's, that's totally great. Um, but you don't have to have the entire property mowed grass. And what will happen is if you start making it, you start planting native trees and shrubs, you're going to get more wildlife, you're going to get more nature, you're going to get more birds. For sure. Um, the other thing we always encourage to, and, and you just touched on it, is keeping a natural shoreline, which I think um, not only is that good for the birds, it's great for your lake, keep the lake healthy. And also, uh, we often hear one of the top bird questions we get is how do I um, discourage can Canada geese from coming and from pooping on my lawn? And what we always say is, well, the, if the answer is in the question, <laughs> stop with the lawn and the geese won't, won't be interested in your property. So I think, again, it's just sort of understanding um, bird behaviors and how they interact with what you put in your yard is really important. Um, I think you were telling me about a tool that Birds Canada has that is helpful to cottagers who might be looking to replant or to, um, you know, to, to reimagine their yards. Yeah, it's called Bird Gardens. Birdgardens.ca is the web address. You, you can also find more information on the Birds Canada website. Check it out, birdgardens.ca. Uh, I also want to point out, uh, if you're interested in learning more about birds, Birds Canada is a fantastic resource. Uh, birdscanada.org is the website. And Jody, I want to say thank you again for coming and joining us on the Cottage Life podcast and teaching us more about birds and the beautiful sounds they make. I'll have my ears out all summer. Yeah, great, Michelle. Thanks so much for having me. If you'd like to see images of the birds we talked about today, go to cottagelife.com slash podcast. Each issue of Cottage Life magazine includes personal reflections on life at the lake. In our November-December 2000 issue, Writer Moira Farr shared her thoughts on a popular cottage pastime that's currently having a moment. Peacekeeping is read by Garvia Bailey. They sit tucked away for years in their worn old boxes on a shelf in a back room, vying for attention alongside sparkier entertainment choices like Clue, Monopoly, Scrabble, and Sorry. Sooner or later, Colonel Mustard and his lead pipe Paul, the allure of being trounced by a ten-year-old in pursuit of Park Place, fades. You haul one out in desperation on the third overcast day in a row, dump the pieces on the big dining table, gloom deepening 
as rain begins a slowly accelerating beat on the roof. Your initial interest in assembling a decades-old landscape pictorial of Peggy's Cove or Autumn Splendor or down on the farm is desultory at best. A fuzzy memory tells you pieces are missing while others bear the marks of age and handling. Image fragments peeling away from cardboard gone woolly around the edges. But your first small interlocking successes hook you in, maybe even draw an initially reluctant crowd. Soon, hands, big and small, eyes sharp or bifocaled, are getting a piece of the action. Character and style are revealed. There are your sky assemblers and edge obsessors, your color coders and system divisors, your easily frustrated and your maniacally focused, your sweetly incompetent and your brutishly competitive. Your slow and steady wins the racers and your frantic victory shouters. But hey, get a grip. It's only a puzzle. Suddenly, hours have gone by. Half a lighthouse has emerged, as well as a good chunk of sky and oceanside rock, though the ocean itself is still mostly a forbidding heap of fiendishly unfittable pieces in a scattered arc around your proudly finished work to date. Someone lights a fire, as it's gotten a bit chilly. Someone else drifts off to read a murder mystery. Still others opt for a defiant plod through the rain. But some hang in, lost in the task of discerning subtle gradations of hue in the patches of sky and sea into which they've fallen. Collective hunger suggests a meal should be served, but no way can the puzzle be moved now. Buffet it is, though perhaps a bit of table space can be made by a careful shifting of pieces, courtesy of the protective arm of the most committed and meticulous puzzler. Maybe you finish the puzzle. Maybe not. Maybe you put it away when you leave. Or maybe you save it for next time. A tantalizing to be continued that lodges nicely in memory. That, after all, is the quaint beauty of the cottage puzzle whether still in its box, halfway done, or resplendently finished. You may have to go places, but it, like the beloved cottage itself, never does. Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. You know, some cottagers are all about the view. Me? I embrace the smells. Whether it's the scent of conifers after a good rain, the Canadian bacon on my cast iron skillet, or the mist off the lake when I'm out for an early morning paddle. That's why I like to use off, deep-free mosquito repellent during my outings. It isn't greasy or oily like some other repellents. And it's odor-free so I can enjoy every breath when I'm outdoors. Plus, it works well over my clothes. And because it's safe to use around plastics, I don't have to worry about my gear. So I can focus on the smells of nature without hearing the sounds of mosquitoes when I'm in the woods. <laughs> Cottage Life is well known for offering our readers little tips and hacks that make life at the lake a little easier. In this episode of the podcast, we offer a solution for a common and most unwelcome cottage problem. Here's the scenario. You're lying in bed, trying to drift off to sleep, hoping you'll hear the haunting loon call across the lake. But instead, you hear drip, drip, drip. It's the bathroom faucet leaking again. To save your sleep until you can fix it in the morning, try this trick. Drop one end of a piece of string an inch down the drain and tie the other around the end of the tap. The water travels noiselessly down the string and you can get some shut eye. <laughs> That's 
it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive to the lake. This episode is sponsored by our Cottage Life paid subscribers. I want to thank them for making this series possible. For new listeners, I invite you to check out our free email newsletters. Visit cottagelife.com slash newsletter to sign up. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me, Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock.